The woman here indicted is charged with the following, that she did lead a great army of evildoers to London, whereupon she did burn down the Duke of Lancaster's palace and behead the King's counsellors, Archbishop Sudbury and Sir Robert Hale. That's me. My name is Joanna Farrar, and in 1381, I led a group of working people in what now has come to be known as the Peasants' Revolt. Afterwards, I was described as the chief perpetrator and leader of a group of rebellious evildoers from Kent. Today, I want to tell you what led us to rise up and explain exactly what happened. To understand our story, we need to go back to 1348, where a terrible plague called the Black Death swept across England, killing up to half the population. The devastation was terrible, and it left a great shortage of workers, even though the land that needed working on remained the same. Ah, my lord. Yes? We was wondering. Would you be improving your offer of work this summer? Improving my offer of work? How dare you? You're a serf. I own you. You do not get to negotiate terms. Actually, sir, since the Black Death, quite a few of the local lords have been improving their working arrangements. They fear that there won't be any serfs left to harvest the crops. <laughs> Some are even offering to pay us cash and let us live rent-free on their land. Hmm. Well, if you don't want her, someone else will. The king sent notice into all counties of the realm that reapers and other labourers should not receive more than they used to take under a penalty defined by statute. Then the king caused many peasants to be arrested and sent them to prison. The king crushed the ambition of the peasants by passing a law called the Statute of Labourers. This banned moving between farms to look for better work conditions and stopped them negotiating better terms for themselves. Wages were pushed back down to pre-plague levels and the feudal law was enforced once again. Now this we might have been able to deal with, but then in 1377 came the poll tax. The first poll tax was issued in 1377, the year Richard II came to the throne. Every person had to pay one groat to the government, regardless of whether they had a lot of money or very little. This had a much bigger impact on the poor than the rich. To help put that in perspective, one groat represented two days' wages to the average peasant. The second poll tax came in 1379, but it was the third tax in 1380 that sparked the peasants' revolt. You see, this time, instead of paying one groat, the tax was increased to three groats, three times the amount of the first tax, and a whole week's wages for a peasant. As you can imagine, the poor were very angry. These poll taxes are unfair. They are too high and the tax collectors are aggressive. Well, with all this money we're paying, the French are still raiding and attacking our coasts. Yeah. Th these foreign wars are too expensive. And it's unfair that we don't get a say in who we work for or how much we get paid. The lords of the manor take all our money for our hard work and we live in poverty. I don't see why we have to work for anyone. I was listening to a preacher, John Ball, who said we're all equal in heaven, so we should be equal on earth. And I agree with him. Yeah, these problems are caused by the king's evil counsellors. These people are giving him bad advice and because of that, the whole country suffers. Yeah. We love our king, yeah. but must do something about these traitors. Yes. Yes. Well, let's march to London. There are others like us coming from Essex already. We can join them, meet with the king, demand an end to serfdom, yeah. freedom from the labour laws, yes. and death to all traitors. Yeah! 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 Much of our anger was focused on the king's uncle, John of Gaunt, 
We believed he was the power behind the throne of the young king. We believed he was pushing the king into making all the wrong decisions, whilst also becoming rich. We couldn't kill him personally, because he was in Scotland at the time of the revolt. So instead, I led my people and burnt down his London home, the Savoy Palace. Here, Gaunt sold all his wealth, so it was the perfect symbol to attack especially since we believed that a lot of that wealth had been siphoned off from the taxes that had been collected. When we marched to London, it was with the aim to present our grievances and complaints to the king in person. As more people joined our ranks, our numbers grew and so did our power. On top of that, it became increasingly clear that we would not disperse until we spoke to the king. As it happened, some peasants ended up meeting him twice. The first was a meeting at Mile End, where another leader of the peasants, Wat Tyler, rode out and spoke to the king in person. Wat Tyler told the king we wanted four things, an end to serfdom, the abolition of all labour laws, a pardon for the, all the rebels involved in the revolt, and a death to those we saw as traitors. The king agreed to all of the demands except the death to the traitors. He even had 30 clerks with him to write the pardons for everyone who was there. But for some of us, including me, that wasn't good enough. So that night, we marched on the Tower of London. Right, he's in there. He is the root of all of our problems. We get rid of him, King Richard could be a good king. I want you both to drag him out and behead him. Right. Together with others, Joanna went as the chief leader to the Tower of London as she laid violent hands first on Simon, recently Archbishop of Canterbury, then on brother Robert Hales, and she dragged them out of the tower and ordered that they be beheaded. After the meeting at Mile End and the subsequent storming of the tower, Many of the peasants felt that their complaints had been heard and answered. They trusted the king to keep his promises, and so many went home. However, for a smaller, more fanatical group of peasants, still led by Wat Tyler, this wasn't enough. This painting shows the second meeting of the peasants and King Richard, this time at Smithfield, on the 15th of June, 1381. This time, Tyler's demands were even more extreme. He asked for all church lands to be shared out equally among the peasants and that every lord's estate be reduced in size. Richard once again agreed, but then there was a scuffle and whilst no one knows whether it was an accident or an assassination, what Tyler was killed. Tyler was not the only one to die because of the peasants' revolt. By the autumn of 1381, King Richard had gone back on all his promises and had hanged many of the peasant leaders as punishment. This meant that in the short term, it looked like the revolt had failed to achieve anything. But in the longer term, the effects of the revolt were more positive. Poll taxes were abolished. Within 10 years, Parliament had stopped trying to control wages. Within 100 years, all peasants were free. But what happened to me? The chroniclers did not write about me by name, but some of the things that happened under my leadership are some of the key moments in the revolt. In fact, even though historians today know what I did, thanks to the records of my trial, they don't know what happened to me, except that I turn up in later court documents. So unlike Wat Tyler, I lived to tell the tale. All the things I achieved are referred to by simply saying what some peasants did, and some historians have argued that this is because chroniclers did not like the idea of political women being able to lead their people. The problem is, people often refer to the chronicles to write modern history books. So over time, my achievements have faded from history. But now you know better. So the next time you hear about the leaders of the Peasants' Revolt, Wat Tyler, John Ball, do not forget about Joanna Farrar.